Thank you. So I'd like to thank the organizers. So I, I don't have any pictures of me and Boris from the past, but uh, we've never written a paper together. But uh, Boris uh, played a big role in my career uh, publicizing my work about 15 years ago on low temperature dephasing. So I'm quite uh, grateful to him for, for that. So I'd like to tell you about a subject that hasn't been really discussed at this um, conference, ferromagnetic Joseph's injunctions. Um, so this is work uh, supported by DOE. And then recently, we're working on uh, trying to make cryogenic memory with uh, IARPA and Northrop Grumman support. So these are various pictures of my group. Um, a lot of people here have contributed, but um, the work I'm going to focus on today was done by Bethany Nadelsky and Eric Ingrick. That's my collaborator, Bill Pratt, without whom uh, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this. Um, so let me just review proximity effect in superconductor normal systems, superconductor ferromagnetic systems. Um, this is sort of the old-fashioned view where you don't uh, worry too much about the details. In superconductor normal, you say that there are paracorrelations that extend into the normal over a distance, the normal metal coherence length that can be very long at low temperature up to hundreds of nanometers micron. In ferromagnet systems, on the other hand, you have extremely short correlations and you have this oscillation. Uh, the physics was actually explained by Amir Jacobi, just to remind you. The idea is if you take a Cooper pair from the superconductor, it's a spin singlet, you put that pair of electrons in the ferromagnet, the two electrons have to go into different bands. Uh, just for the record, real ferromagnets don't have this band structure, right? This is a theorist's uh, cartoon band structure. It looks just like a Zeeman split metal. But for the f physics we want to talk about, this is, this is what you need to do. Um, and so the point is the pair picks up a momentum, Q, which is just the difference between the Fermi wave vectors and the two bands, or you can express it in terms of the exchange energy divided by the uh, Fermi velocity. Uh, and so you can also think of this, this momentum as an oscillation of the pair correlation function. Um, and that oscillation, <clears throat> well, in 1D, it would just oscillate forever if there were no dephasing. But in 3D, there's an angular average that gives you a de an algebraic decay. And then a diff diffusive system, of course, you get an exponential decay. And the oscillation length scale, then, of course, is just the inverse of this Q. Um, so it's uh, Fermi velocity divided by exchange energy. And so you can see from this why, uh, why this distance is so short. Exchange energies and strong ferromagnets are large. They can be of order an electron volt. So you get extremely short length scale. So just to review, the, the two differences in the systems are in normal metal, you get correlations over long distance, and they just monotonically decay. In the ferromagnet, you have correlations that decay, decay very quickly, a very short length scale. And there's this oscillation. So how do you see this oscillation in experiments? Um, I will only talk about one of the ways, and that is if you make a Joseph's injunction, so you have two superconductors separated by a ferromagnet. That oscillation <clears throat> tells you that if you're in the right um, uh, range of, of thicknesses, that you actually invert the sign of your, uh, of your current phase relation. So you get what's called the pi state. It just means that in equilibrium, the two superconductors have a pi phase difference between them. So this was. Um, <laughs> So by the way, this, the, I should just say the theory of this, I didn't write down any of the people. So this theory was done really around 1980 by people in Russia, Sasha Buzdin. There was a paper before by Bulyevsky. Uh, so this had been known about for a long time. But uh, experimentally, it was difficult because this length scale was so short, it was hard to controllably make samples to, to discover, to uh, uh, look at that physics systematically. So the big breakthrough really occurred in 2001 of Valery Ryazanov and Chernogolovka in uh, collaboration with Jan Arts and Leiden, used a weak ferromagnetic alloy. They used a copper nickel alloy. Uh, the purpose was to decrease the exchange energy and hence increase this length scale from, say, a nanometer to several nanometers. That makes the experiments much more feasible. And these are actually data from their 2006 paper. But you can clearly see these, uh, these um, uh, you know, minima in the uh, critical current, and those signify the transition from the zero state to the pi state. This is not a phase-sensitive measurement, but later phase-sensitive measurements were made. It's, it's definitely well established. Um, and then actually later, this was done in strong ferromagnets also. This is work by Mark Blameyer's group in Cambridge, 2005. They did cobalt, uh, permaloy, iron, I think. Um, and you can see these oscillations occur over a very, very short length scale. Um, maybe not quite as many data points per oscillation, but I think we believe that, uh, that that's what they're seeing. So this physics, I think, is, is well understood. And I'm 
Um, this has not been the focus of my own work, although I will come back to this at the end of the talk, as there turns out there's still some interesting things to do here. Um, so the focus of my work has been on this uh, theoretical discovery in 2001, these two papers, um, where they basically said that uh, you can take a conventional superconductor that has spin singlet pairs, you can somehow convert them to spin triplet pairs using ferromagnets, and I'll tell you in a little bit about a little more how that's done. Um, I do want to also cite this 2007 paper by Uze and Buzdin because they're the ones who really suggested a, a uh, viable experimental geometry where this can be done controllably. This is, this is their exper experimental geometry where you have three ferromagnets, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And the, the basic uh, point behind all this theory is that if you have non-collinear magnetization, you can convert pairs from spin singlet to spin triplet. So as an experimentalist, how do you uh, see that this is happening? So if you make Josephson junctions and you, say, increase the distance of this middle ferromagnetic layer, if you only have spin, sing spin singlet correlations, the supercurrent's going to drop extremely quickly. I didn't bother to draw the oscillations here, but the point is you'll have an extremely steep decay over that very short ferromagnetic coherence length that has the exchange energy in the denominator. If you are capable of converting spin singlets to spin triplets, the triplets, of course, don't, uh, they're not bothered by the ferromagnet because in particular, let's say you have the up-up component of the triplet. That means both <laughs> electrons are in the same spin band. And so for that component of uh, pair correlations, they view the ferromagnet just as a normal metal. So they have the long length scale. So I've, I've written the uh, normal metal coherence length for the triplet. Of course, in real life, there are other processes such as uh, spin memory loss processes, spin orbit scattering, et cetera, but we'll sweep those under the rug for now. The point is there's a huge difference in principle between the very short length scale of the singlet and the much longer length scale of the triplet. Okay, so I'll talk about, I won't talk about all the work that's been done in the world. I'll just talk about uh, the work of our group. Um, everything we've done is, is in this uh, standard sandwich style uh, Josephson junction, so the current flows vertically. We have niobium on the bottom, niobium on the top. Uh, don't worry about this gold, that's part of the fabrication process. And then the ferromagnets are sandwiched in the middle and there can be multiple ferromagnetic layers as I showed you in the previous uh, slide. So I will skip all the uh, shenanigans we went through trying to get reasonable results and just show you our reasonable results. So um, we came up with this structure and there's, you know, I could give you a long talk about how we came up with this, but rather than do that, let me just compare our structure to the one suggested by Uze and Buzden, and you'll see it's very similar. We have two thin ferromagnets on either side. That's these two, F prime, F double prime. We have something in the middle that's uh, a thick ferromagnet. It's actually a cobalt ruthenium cobalt, and I'll tell you in just a minute why we, uh, why we chose that. Uh, the point is, when you make the structure and you vary the thickness of the central ferromagnet, if you don't have these two thin ferromagnets on the outside, you just get a very steep exponential decrease of the critical current as a function of the thickness of the cobalt. Um, so that's these black points that, um, that was actually from an earlier paper. Um, if that doesn't look steep to you, just look at the numbers here. We're dropping uh, critical current by four orders of magnitude as we go up to 20 to 25 nanometers of cobalt. So it's a very, very steep decrease. Now you add these two thin layers. In this particular case, this was palladium nickel, uh, but you can do it with other things too. Um, and you see that you get this, uh, what, it, what appears to be not decaying at all, but at least it's decaying on a very, very slow uh, length scale compared to this. So by the time you get out to 20 nanometers cobalt, you have a factor of 100 or so enhancement of the critical current. So that's the strong evidence for the, for the spin triplet. Um, if you'd like to see what happens when you fix the cobalt and vary the thickness of these two outer layers, uh, so we just sit along this blue line here and vary this thickness from zero up to four and beyond. That's this graph. So you can see that, um, so here's three different materials, copper, nickel, palladium, nickel, and actually just nickel. Um, so you can see as you, as you start at zero, you're way down here. You increase the thickness, it comes up, and then at some point it goes back down again. You know it's going to go back down because the, the, uh, the spin singlet will just die in that uh, in, if, if you uh, make that thing too thick, but somehow there's a conversion to spin triplet. If you stay up here, then you get this very, this very large enhancement. So how does this work? Um, so obviously I'm not gonna go through uh, Uzadel equations and Green's functions for you, but there's a, there's a nice hand-waving argument due to Matthias Eschrig that I'll just take you through. 
So um, this is extremely hand-waving. We're not even going to write down the BCS wave function. We're just going to write down the spin part. So we're, we start with a spin singlet. Now we look at this physics that I already talked about, this uh, FFLO type of, type of physics. So if you have your up-down, you pick up this, this, the center of mass uh, coordinate picks up this momentum Q, which is just KF up minus KF down. But of course, I could have also put the down spin on the right and the up spin on the left, which is this down upturn, and then I pick up e to the minus IQX instead. So now you just rearrange using the Euler formula, and you see you recover the spin singlet with cosine QX, and you pick up the M equals zero triplet component with, uh, with sine QX. Now don't get too excited because that M equals zero triplet component is also short range, it also oscillates. So it's not, uh, it's not giving you any new physics. To get the new physics, you have to put a second ferromagnet in with its magnetization rotated at some angle theta, and now you just take this, this uh, spin triplet component here and you realize that in the new basis it contains all three components. So we've now generated two long range components in this middle ferromagnet. If I make this middle ferromagnet thick, this M equals zero component will die out. The spin singlet component dies out and I'm just left with these two long range triplet components. Now you might think I could just slap another superconductor here and I'd be done. That doesn't work because the, the niobium doesn't recognize these two components. So you have to somehow convert back again uh, in order to get the complete Joseph's injection. So that's why you have the third, uh, the third ferromagnet. And um, so uh, if, I, if I, oh, sorry, let me just go back to this picture. Um, so if you look at this, you see that, you know, why, why does the nickel come up so quickly compared to, say, the palladium nickel? And that's because it has a larger exchange energy and therefore a shorter CF. So you, you do this phase rotation more quickly and then and you, get the, uh, you get the big triplet component. Okay, so I, I need to answer this other question. Why did we actually use that cobalt ruthenium cobalt? Why didn't we just use a, a straight ferromagnet? So that's a technical issue, but it's an important one, so I want to take a minute. So you all know about Fraunhofer patterns. You put a magnetic field transverse to the current direction, and you should get this nice uh, diffraction pattern. But we were working with large area junctions at this time we did these measurements, and Cobalt's a very strong magnet. Uh, actually, all these strong ferromagnets break up into domains. And it turns out if you make a large area Joseph's injunction with a thick ferromagnet in it with lots of domains, your Fraunhofer pattern is a complete mess. Now, this is, this is not noise in the sense that it's reproducible in a given sample if you don't go to too high field, of course. Um, but you can see there's lots of destructive interference if you're trying to do systematic uh, studies as a function of, say, ferromagnet thickness, and you have data like this, you're, uh, you're really out of luck. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to get rid of the flux in the junction, and my colleague Bill Pratt knew about this trick that they, that they use in the magnetism community. When you take uh, ruthenium of just the right thickness, say about 0.7 nanometers or so, then you antiferromagnetically couple the, the, uh, the cobalt layers on either side. So even if your sample is multi-domain, each domain at a time, you cancel the flux, and so you recover a very nice Fraunhofer pattern. So that's, that was an important technical trick, and it's what allowed us to get these uh, systematic data over a, over a wide range. So in the rest of my talk, I think all the triplet samples I talk about are going to have this. Actually, I'm not going to do so much more triplet in this talk, but let's see what's, uh, what's next. Um, oh yeah, so um, the next thing you'd like to do is you'd like to have some sort of control and the very first thing we thought about is, well, by all means, we should try magnetizing the samples. If you get all the magnetizations pointing in the same direction, this triplet should go away. Because remember, you need non-collinear magnetizations to develop the, uh, to get that basis rotation. So you can imagine on this curve, let's say you've got a sample with triplet in it. If you magnetize it, you should somehow drop down to this other curve and see a big uh, decrease. So we asked our student to do that experiment, and she did. And uh, these are her data. I should just point out, this is, this is not the measurement field. This is a magnetizing field. All these measurements were done in zero field. So this was her sample in the virgin state. She applied a field. She took it back to zero, measured a Fraunhofer pattern, plotted the peak. She kept on doing that. And lo and behold, she got an increase of a factor of 20 in the critical current. So that, uh, that was a bit of a surprise because we thought that magnetizing it was going to make the effect go away. But um, it turns out, so my colleague Bill Pratt knew the answer to this also. Um, it turns out that these uh, cobalt ruthenium cobalt synthetic antiferromagnets have an interesting property. They undergo what's called a spin flop transition. 
So this is an, an artist's rendition of the domain structure in the virgin state of our four ferromagnetic layers, the two free nickel layers and this cobalt, the two cobalt layers and this uh, cobalt ruthenium cobalt. Um, these are supposed to be completely random pictures, except for if you look carefully at the two blue ones, you'll notice that they're anti-ferromagnetically coupled everywhere. So there's an arrow to the right, there's an arrow to the left, uh, et cetera. So now we apply a big field, say, to your right. We magnetize the two nickel samples. The cobalt ruthenium cobalt, of course, it's trying to be anti-parallel. You're putting a big field to the right. You're forcing it this way, so it's scissoring toward the field. But now what happens when you take off the field, it scissors back to 90 degrees away from the direction of the field. So you've done two things. You've magnetized the nickel layer so you don't have all these random domains, and you've optimized this angle of 90 degrees between the, the outside nickel and the inside cobalt. So that, uh, that seemed plausible. We decided that to confirm that, we should probably do some, uh, some more sensitive measurements. So we sent samples to NIST, where um, John Anguris did uh, SEMPA, and uh, Julie Borchers did polarized neutron reflection, and that seemed to support this, uh, this interpretation. OK, so what do you do next? Um, so these are sort of the next two things you'd like to do. There's, there's two more ways you can, you can control the thing. Rather than just have a multi-domain sample, what you'd really like to do is have single domain samples where you could actually control the directions of all the magnetizations. So the two experiments you'd like to do Let's say you have a sample like this where you've somehow managed to, <clears throat> well, actually this particular picture is a little tricky having these two uh, opposite. I should probably put this to the right, but that's, that's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, the point is here I've got 90 degrees between the magnetization directions of each adjacent layer. That optimizes the spin triplet because it's proportional to the sine of the angles between uh, adjacent magnetic layer magnetizations. If I rotate this one so that it's parallel to, say, the middle one, that should turn the triplet off. So this is an on-off experiment. It requires a 90-degree rotation. Um, the advantage is it only requires one junction because it's just an amplitude measurement. But it does require two orthogonal field coils, which we didn't have for a long time. We finally got that, and then we're able to do this experiment. So we have done this, and I'm in the middle of writing the paper. And if there's time, I might show you those data. If not, I won't worry about it. Um, the measurement that we actually chose to do first was this one. So it turns out if you go through that, that hand-waving derivation I showed you by Matthias Eschrig, it's very easy to show that depending on whether, let's say I start from the bottom, I rotate in one direction to get to here. If I continue rotating in the same direction, it turns out I get a zero junction. If I rotate in the other way, I get a pi junction. And that just is a property of spin rotation matrices. And so the... Um, the advantage of this measurement is you're just reversing the direction of one layer, so you only need one magnet. Uh, the disadvantage is, of course, it's, you, this is a phase measurement. You need a squid. You have to do an interference measurement, and you have to have two junctions, both of which are working nicely. So we've actually done this experiment, too, and the data are in one of my students' PhD thesis. Um, the data are not great, and I, again, I may show them to you later, um, but I'd rather, what I'd like to do is show you something else, which has actually worked in my opinion, better than either of these. So I'm going to move away from spin triplet for a few minutes, maybe, maybe the rest of the talk. We'll see how it goes. Um, return back to the spin singlet. Um, and it turns out, even with the spin singlet, you can also make a controllable junction. It's not so obvious how you do that, because you don't have this spin rotation here. You have phase shifts that accumulate. But I'll show you, it turns out it's actually very straightforward. And um, you'll see why it's actually easier than those other experiments. So let's, ret let's return to this basic physics that, again, uh, um, we talked about early in the talk. Namely, if you just have an SFS junction, you get this oscillating and decaying critical current as a function of the ferromagnetic layer, layer thickness. Now let's say I make a spin valve, which is two magnetic layers. And I have the option of the, having their magnetizations parallel or anti-parallel. Since I'm fixing the total thickness, I'm just going to get rid of that decay and plot the oscillating part with, a, with just a constant amplitude and just ask myself, how much phase does a Cooper pair accumulate as it goes through the ferromagnets? So let's say through F1, the, uh, you know, the up-down term accumulates phase relative to the down-up term, term. When I go through the second ferromagnet, if its magnetization is, is parallel, I continue to accumulate phase. If it's anti-parallel, then I subtract phase. So imagine that the thickness of the first one puts me here on this diagram. 
Then in the parallel state, the second one moves me to the right. The anti-parallel state, it moves me back to the left. So it turns out just with a single junction, you can also get a, you should be able to control whether you're in the pi state or the zero state. I just emphasize the physics is very different from the triplet. In the triplet case, we're using spin rotations. Here we're using phase accumulation or subtraction. So this is the experiment we want to do. We want to do a spin valve. And you can see why maybe this one worked first. This one only has two magnetic layers to control as opposed to the triplet, which has three magnetic layers. This one's just a little easier to control. OK, so the experiment, uh, we have to make a squid. So first, we make small junctions. Um, that's not too hard to do using E-beam lithography. We're making elliptical junctions. We actually, since we have a squid with two of these junctions, what we'd like to do is make them elliptical with different aspect ratios. This micrograph here actually shows junctions that are much larger than what we finally used. The, the ones we finally used are typically a half micron wide by one and a quarter microns long. It's typical aspect ratio. What we do is we make one with a longer, longer, bigger aspect ratio, longer and skinnier, and the other one that's a little shorter and fatter. Maybe it's easier to see over here. Um, this, this shows two different squids. There's a flux line running up the middle, so you can put flux in the squid to measure the squid oscillation pattern. The two junctions. And then the in-plane field in this direction is to switch the free layer. Oh yeah, one other thing I have to say, we're using a hard magnetic layer, a hard magnetic material and a soft material. The soft material is permaloy. Um, the hard magnetic material is nickel. Nickel is not so well behaved, but it's uh, the best we have at the moment. So the idea is with a small field, we'll, we'll align everything with a big field. And then with a small field, we hope to rotate the permaloy and in particular, the idea is we can switch the permaloy in the fatter junction first and then in the skinnier junction. This is just an artist's rendition of the same physics, um, showing the, the two junctions in the squid and then the four different states, which we've, we've labeled them already pi pi, zero pi, zero zero pi zero, in anticipation of the, what we're going to see. And I'll try to convince you that the data um, actually support that interpretation. So, what, so going from pi pi to zero pi, we've just switched the permaloy layer in one of the junctions, then we switch the permaloy layer in the second junction, then we switch back the permaloy layer in the first junction, then finally you get back to the initial state. And this, this just again to uh, just make sure everybody understands what we're doing. So here's the squid again. If the two junctions are in the same state, it doesn't matter if they're both zero or both pi, you get constructive interference in the critical current of the squid versus applied flux. If you switch one of the junctions, then you'll get destructive interference. You switch both junctions, you'll get constructive interference again. So that's what the experiment is meant to see. So let's look at some data. Um, the data I'm going to plot in a three-dimensional plot. So I'm plotting critical current as a function of the flux or the squid. It's uh, listed in milliamps. It turns out the conversion is almost exactly one milliamp per flux quantum. So uh, you can just read this as flux and flux quantum. Um, this is the in-plane field we apply to try to flip the junctions. So the protocol is we initialize everything with the field in the negative direction. So we're in this state, all, magnetiz all magnetic layers, all magnetizations are pointing to the left. Now at, at around uh, 30 Ørsted or so, you see there's this big jump. The critical current changes, and you can also see there's a phase shift. The position of the peak has shifted relative to here. Um, I'll, I'll interpret that tentatively as we flip the permaloy layer in one junction. And again, I have to prove that later to, that that's actually what happens. Then we go to a slightly higher field, 50 years stead. Again, there's a big jump and a big phase shift. So we interpret that as we've now flipped the second junction. So we're now, both junctions are in the uh, zero state. Here we come back in the negative direction. So we start at zero in this state. Uh, we come back at minus 35 years stead. There's a switch to yet another state. That claim is we've switched the first junction back again. And then finally, up at around 90 or 100 or stead, we get back to the, uh, to the initial state. So just to summarize the observations, um, first of all, the critical current is periodic in flux with period phi naught, as you expect. We get magnetic transitions at these four fields. Both the amplitude and the phase change. So that simple FI picture I drew for you was not completely correct. Um, then those of you who know what a squid looks like, you notice that these uh, Critical current oscillations here have a funny ratchet shape. I mean, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, you know, you're used to seeing something like this. It's an absolute value of a cosine curve. And you'll notice that these, um, these oscillations here in IC plus don't look anything like that cosine curve. First of all, the uh, modulation is not very deep. 
Second of all, it has a funny asymmetric shape. It's not cosine, it's ratchet. That's a little bit confusing until you look back in the squid literature and it turns out this is all very well understood. Um, if you model the squid as uh, just having you know, two junctions and two inductances, it turns out that, that that idealized cosine curve you get only if you can ignore these inductances. So if the product of the critical current times the inductance is very small compared to a flux quantum, then you just forget about the inductances and you have the simple squid model. Um, once the, so we, we designed those squids actually for spin triplet experiments. We used them for spin singlet. Our critical currents were 10 times higher. We were a little caught off guard. So uh, we have to deal with, uh, with, deal with this. And then the other thing is our geometry is asymmetric. Our geometry looks like this. So the current going around the clockwise direction actually has a much larger flux coupling than the current going counterclockwise. So the two inductances are unequal. So it turns out when that's the case, and then of course our two junctions, the critical currents are switching, so they're gonna be unequal by necessity. So it turns out in this case, you get that the IC plus and the IC minus, the critical currents in the two directions are not equal in general. They both oscillate with the period of the flux quantum, but the peaks are shifted with respect to each other in op equal and opposite directions. So to do the analysis, you actually have to go through a little bit of curve fitting, which we've done, um, and everything is very consistent. In fact, we, we've get, we get very nice fits to all the data sets. So here, what I've done is I've taken a slice through those three-dimensional pictures at four different values of the magnetic field. This was the initial state. This is after we had one switch, this is after the second switch, and then this is after the switch in the opposite direction. The solid lines are fits to that simple squid model, and as you can see, the fits are excellent, and all four fits give you a consistent set of, in, of inductances in the squid. Um, if you prefer, you can plot what I call the average critical current, which is just the, uh, the sum of the two in absolute value divided by two, um, and here you get something that is, doesn't have this funny asymmetry, so this, this symmetrizes the effect, and you can see very easily that the peaks and valleys line up, um, which shows you conceptually that, uh, that you're getting pi phase shifts each time you, you go through one of these uh, transitions. So um, I think probably you don't want to see all the, um, all the fitting parameters. I just want to show you that if you do the four fits, the inductance values you get are extremely self-consistent. You get very, very small uh, standard deviation um, for the two, uh, the two inductances. So it's about six picohenries and 12 picohenries for the, for the two sides of the squid. And then I'll, go, I'll, I'll jump through this stuff. This is just to, uh, if somebody asks me, I can prove to you that we actually did all the, uh, we did all the, all the fitting correctly. So um, how much time would you like me to speak as opposed to questions? Three minutes. three minutes? Okay, so let me just show you one more thing which will literally take three minutes. So going back to here, back to the spin triplet, um, these data I won't show you because first of all, they'll be published, we'll, we'll submit them pretty soon and it's a little bit long and complicated. I would say the data are decent but they're not spectacular. Um, this one I'll show you just so you can see why I've been so frustrated uh, doing this. Um, so it, exactly the same experiment. It's a squid experiment. Everything looks like the previous, uh, the previous few slides I showed you. So we first, um, uh, we first got data like this. So here again is this 3D plot. We're ramping up the set field. So here you see these nice squid oscillations. They're quite a bit deeper uh, than before because the critical currents are much smaller. Here we're at 30 microamps instead of 300 microamps or 500 microamps. And then uh, it's hard to see in this 3D picture, but if you look top down, you can see very clearly this beautiful pi phase shift here and then another pi phase shift there. So we were jumping out of our seats with joy and then uh, we applied the field in the opposite direction to get back to the initial state and we got this mess. Um, and that was uh, extremely frustrating and we, we haven't been able to get it. What we really wanted, of course, was to just re, you know, reproduce something like this in the opposite direction. And I just couldn't bear to publish garbage data like this. So these data have not been published. This is in my, my student's thesis. A little bit frustrating. Okay, so let me skip. Um, as I say, we've, we've done this experiment too. Maybe I just show one data set. Um, so here we're just trying to rotate one magnet 90 degrees to turn the thing on and off. And I'll just show you these data. Here we're measuring in zero field. And we're applying this field, and you can see the critical current is coming down, down, down. It would have been nice if it had just dropped to zero there. It's getting stuck on some probably inhomogeneity due to roughness. And then going the other way, it comes, comes back up very nicely. So we have succeeded in doing that. Um, it just would have been nice if it had happened a little more abruptly. So I'm going to skip all those. Uh, 
and just show you, um, go to the conclusions. Uh, so the conclusions are, um, there's long range spin triplet supercurrents are definitely there. Um, they require three ferromagnetic layers. You can control the supercurrent with the magnetic state. We've done a decent job or not so great a job depending on which experiment you talk about. Um, I didn't talk about this crazy uh, odd frequency fermion pairing, but given the number of theorists in the audience, I'm sure we could start a large uh, discussion of that. Um, originally, I thought this was extremely exotic, and then in recent years, people have told me this is actually much more common than, than was thought, so I won't say much about it. Um, the, uh, the, new, the newest thing I showed you is that actually even the short-range spin singlet supercurrent can be controlled using a spin valve junction, and as you can imagine, uh, since I told you we're working on this for cryogenic memory, that's, that's probably going to be our memory device. Um, and if you're new to this topic and you'd like to read about it, Matthias Eschring wrote a nice, uh, a, uh, a nice uh, overview of the topic in physics today in 2001. So again, uh, happy birthday, Boris, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. So.